He's in somebody's court. 12, 14. Rife Kimler. No, I don't have the business. Okay, thank you. Rife. <laughs> well, I got the, the defendant is waving to me. He can hear me okay. Rife. Rife. I can get it. You're coming in great. It's your attorney who is. <laughs> He's not, not even on anymore. Not now. He's off. <laughs> this works so well. Here goes. Oh, there's a guy. Hey, Daddy. Oh yeah, that doesn't make me seasick. I'm watching that. Twenty-two dash four zero zero eight zero. Give it to Lori. She can. She knows how to work those things. Thanks, Lori. This. This is. Mute him permanently. <laughs> Is there? Okay, you left the meeting. Okay, there you go. All right, 22-40080 is now called the State of Texas versus Matthew David Leonard McElroy. You are Mr. McElroy. Yes, sir. Present, and you, there's uh, Mr. Kimler here in the courtroom. Yes, sir. Earlier... You pleaded guilty to this second degree felony of tampering with physical evidence. A pre sentence report has been prepared. Have the parties had an opportunity to review it? And are there any corrections or changes to it? Not from the defense. Not from the state, Your Honor. Update on, on certain. Yeah. Thank you. All right. The pre sentence report is made a part of the record for all purposes. Now, Correct me if I'm wrong. It, his criminal history is obviously um, a little maximized, uh, maximized here. We have a beginning in 2001. It looks like uh, the defendant was placed on probation for illegal possession of a controlled substance and then later that was revoked uh, like two and a half years later and he was sentenced to two years in the state jail then in 2003 he was also placed on deferred probation for an offense that he committed after he was placed on deferred probation in the illegal possession of controlled substance case we first talked about and that was an illegal, another illegal possession of a controlled substance. The court placed him on deferred probation for eight years. That was revoked on the same at the same time. His earlier probation was revoked, and he received four years in prison. I can't. There's another. Illegal possession of a controlled substance. I see date of offense was September 19th of 03. After he was placed on probation for the first two illegal possession of controlled substances. That case was adjudicated at the same time that he was sentenced to prison and state jail on the previous illegal possession cases. And he received two years state jail confinement on that. Thereafter, in 2009, the defendant is charged with tampering with physical evidence, and that was adjudicated by a jury trial. It was in this court? Uh, probably so, Your Honor. And he received 10 years imprisonment there. So that would be his fourth felony. Then yes. later on, in 2015... He receives another tampering with physical evidence case, and that was uh, adjudicated, and he received five years imprisonment in 2015. Thereafter, in 2019, he is charged with illegal possession of a controlled substance and was sentenced to one year in the state jail in November of 21. But he also received a second one-year state jail confinement on a second possession of a controlled substance 
which apparently occurred two months after his first arrest of possession of the controlled substance. That's the way I figured. So, so that is how many? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven convictions of felonies, including two of tampering with physical evidence. And that's the crime he's charged with now. Okay. Um, that's essentially the criminal history. And in this case, the defendant pleaded guilty to paragraphs one and two, paragraph one being elite tampering with physical evidence involving a bottle containing fencyclidine or PCP. And he also pleaded true to one of the illegal possessions of controlled substance convict convictions, the one from 2004 that we had mentioned, uh, that I had mentioned earlier. So it's a third degree felony, which has been um, in, increased to a second degree felony or enhanced by virtue of the one of the three prior felony convictions that the defendant was charged with. And the court would note, had he been convicted of everything here, he would be looking at a habitual, habitual felony 25. status, which would have been no less than 25, nor more than 99 years confinement in prison or life imprisonment. But as it was, Mr. Robert Kimmler was able to negotiate a uh, uh, a deal here where whatever Senate shall not exceed a cap of 15 years uh, confinement in prison. So we are looking at no less than two nor more than 15 years confinement in prison. He could be placed on deferred or unadjudicated probation as well. He could be placed on regular probation. All right. I think those are the boundaries that we're looking at. And uh, again, uh, no objections to the pre-sentence report. Mm -hmm. Okay, then go ahead from the, for the defense, Mr. Kramer. Your Honor, uh, I would note that in the third paragraph of the recommendation portion of the pre-sentence report, the uh, preparing probation officer sagaciously notes that a study of defendant's known criminal history emphatically suggests that the possession and use of illegal substance that have been in a very and destructive force throughout his adult life. I think that about sums up the position that Mr. McElroy is in facing the court today with the substantial criminal history that he has and the long and storied convictions uh, that he has for drug possession and the associated tampering with evidence type of offenses. I've uh, talked to Mr. McElroy extensively in this case, particularly uh, you know, prior to entering the plea and then subsequent to that in preparation for the sentencing hearing. I sort of regret him not actually being here in person. I know that, you know, the court making these decisions tries to consider all aspects of the defendant, defendant's mm -hmm. de demeanor and everything else. And I think if the defendant were present in person, perhaps the court would have a better feel for where he, where he is in this particular moment of his life as far as uh, desiring to remediate his drug dependency and drug abuse. I know that uh, in talking with him, I've discussed why, I, I mean, I guess the ideology, so to speak, of his substance abuse issues and why he uses or has continued to use PCP in particular, the, the criminal history that he's accumulated. And, and, and in talking with him, it appears to me, of course, I'm not an expert, that he's used it repeatedly, used PCP repeatedly as a coping mechanism for various traumas and stresses of his life in this particular case. And again, I'm not offering this as to uh, detract from his culpability or to excuse it, but he's dealing with the death of a relative. And and I assume that instead of just dealing with the normal grief process, he chose to uh, mask that with, uh, with PCP and the effects, the psychoactive effects that has on, on him and uh, which enabled him to sort of uh, cope or deal with uh, the psychology, the, the grief, the psychological grief that he was going through. Uh, I've talked to him about treatment modalities. I've, I've spoken to him again through my own, through um, 
you know, my studies, things that have tended to seem to work with people that are in this situation, whether it's, uh, you know, the exercise of mindfulness and looking at the problem and trying to examine rationally why he tends to, or why he's continued to engage in conduct that's self-destructive. And um, I think that he has insight, or at least has demonstrated the ability to have insight to me anyway, that he recognizes the problem and possesses a sincere desire to, to change his behaviors. And it's for that reason that I would recommend that the court defer the adjudication of guilt, placing on probation for 10 years, which would expose him to the full punishment range of 20 years. <laughs> but that, uh, I, and here's where mm -hmm. I converse with the recommendation of CSI report that if the court is inclined to do that, that he would be required to attend and, and successfully complete the safety program. Because I think without that type of structure and, and uh, counseling that he would probably fall short on the deferred selection and be exposed to the full 20 years. I think safe B could provide him with um, the, the, the modalities and structure that he needs to, to um, reify his desire to, to become substance abuse free to live a sober lifestyle. Should the court uh, exercise its discretion and sentence to the maximum allowed under the plea bargain, it would be 15 years. And even on that sentence, I'm sure the court's aware that in all likelihood, he would probably do substantially less than the 15 years. And then it would be returned to society basically the same as he is now with the same substance abuse issues and and a strong likelihood of recidivist behavior and reoffend and be back in the same situation with drugs that he is now. And that's, again, why I would suggest to the court that if, if he were here available to address the court in person, I think it would perhaps be more apparent to the court of his sincere desire to become drug free mm -hmm. and his willingness to participate in safety and try to avail himself of all the opportunities that would offer him if the court would allow him to be on probation and successfully complete it. All right, State. Oh, Your Honor, as the court's aware, the defendant has a extensive prior criminal history, as well as uh, he has a prior tampering with physical evidence, which is the same offense he's charged with here, one of them. Uh, and he received 10 years in this court on uh, March 8, 2010 for that. And keeping uh, consistent with the court's uh, previous uh, rulings on these type of cases is that uh, the state believes he should get more than he got the last time for the same type of offense, uh, which uh, the state would be asking for the 15 years. However, the court finds the defendant uh, obviously is in more need of a drug treatment for this. The state's also uh, fine fine with that as well. Mr. Mr. Mackerel, I wanted to address. Go ahead, defendant, Mr. Mackerel. What do you want to say? Uh, Sianna, I'm getting older in age, and I do have a problem. I recognize it. And the excuses and all that is not worth it. My my time is not worth it. My key is not worth it. Nothing. So I'm, I'm tired of losing behind it. Doesn't make any sense. As far as treatment, I take any kind of treatment. Anything else? Your Honor, I apologize that Mr. McElroy is not more articulate, but I do believe, based on my extensive discussions with him, <laughs> that although he's not able to express himself as I would particularly like, he he possesses a sincere desire to change his behavior. Is what I've been able, and of course I'm not. I can't look into it and say that for a fact, but he gives every indication to me that he preached sort of the end of the line with this and it won't <laughs> treatment and help. Now, is that to say that once he gets the treatment and help, he's going to be able to succeed and be drug free? No, that's why you put him on deferred. And if he has a slip up again, you've got the full range of punishment of 20 okay. years open to you. So, but what is it, what risk is it with getting a chance to- Have, have you read to... the pre-sentence report? Yes, I, I know he's got a lot of criminal history. Not, not that, he's been in and out of treatment. Well, but he, I, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> Safe pee treatment. The point that he's reached, you know, in life, that he's no. Now it's on his. Now it's he's decided he's going to do it. No, 
This is 22 years solid of this type of behavior that he's been convicted for. 22 years. He's been on probation three separate times, three separate times and failed. He's been to prison four separate mm -hmm. times, four separate times. Yeah. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, you know, eight convictions. Seven of these are felonies. And here, history of substance abuse treatment. The defendant attended treatment within a substance abuse safe P facility in 2019 and proceeding into 2020. He has also sought unsuccessfully privatized inpatient treatment in Houston prior to return to Jefferson County in October of 2022. And his last employment in October of 22, he failed his drug test with fencycladine. This, yes, they tried. He's tried. He's tried. The others have tried. He just has a consistent desire to revert back to bad decision making. 22 full years of drug related crimes. And he's gotten even the most substance abuse felony punishment, which is as much as we can do. And he steals. God bless you. Anyway, all of it is nervous that he's at a stage in his life where he's older and I think possesses perhaps at an increased degree of ability to reflect and observe his conduct. And should the court tell him on probation, again, you have the full 20 years that you could sentence him to. Whereas if he sentenced him to the penitentiary based on his history, there's no reason to think that it's not going to follow his pattern that he's going to do. I don't know, seven or eight years at the most. You know, the thing, not, not, to enter, not, not to end, enter into this, but that's not what you tendered to the court with his rich criminal history and his pre sentence report mm -hmm. is not something, those are not options I'm going to take. Now, I would be willing to consider if he wants to plead to habitual felon and be placed on habitual on deferred, I might be willing to consider that. I'd have to speak with him and explain to him. But he'd be looking at life imprisonment if he made one, which this court wouldn't hesitate to do under these circumstances. But what we could I'm do, not telling you how to do things, what, what but we, we could he do. has been an absolute failure here. And just telling me now after seven convictions, eight convictions, and into safety and other treatments, that now really he's really this time he's promising his promises are going to be good. Every time he went on probation, which was four separate probations, he failed. He made a promise. I will follow all the terms. And if I don't, then I know I can be uh, uh, I can be revoked. I wonder if the court is back in the best indication of future behaviors, past behaviors oh. as well. But it's it, but right now. It's that cap is at 15, which the court is is looking at at the top end, of course, based upon his rich criminal history and his failure and his attempts to help himself, which he's had more than his fair opportunities. But if somebody like this wants to be placed on deferred or unadjudicated probation, looking at life imprisonment, that's about as much of a uh, motivation aspect. But on the other side of the coin, it would, on my watch, not to, you know, a failure would not be a real viable option. Actually, Your Honor, I guess the way we, I have my suggestion to just to go ahead and sentence him and I'll go out and speak with him about the alternative and see if that's something that he would like to do. I think the court has 30 days. I could file a motion to for resentencing if he doesn't. If nothing further, I'm going to find as follows, sir, that you have pleaded a guilty and true to paragraphs one and two, respectively, of this indictment, which constitute tampering with physical evidence as punished as a second degree felony. You understood and appreciated the consequences of pleading guilty and true. There's sufficient evidence supporting your pleas to find you guilty of paragraphs one and two. I so find you guilty and true of paragraphs one and two. Uh, and that is a second degree felony. I am following this agreement. You were hereby sentenced to confinement in the institutional division 
of the Texas Department of Criminal Justice to serve a term of 15 years. You will be given credit. You've got over 140 days uh, unofficially uh, credit. There is a second case which would be dismissed. I'll hold all of that, though, until uh, you want to come back and let me know uh, how things are. Yes, thank you. But, you know, that's just an option, again, that the court would would consider, which I hate getting involved in this, but you're looking at for something. And in his case, he has painted a picture that is distressing for himself and for the community. Mm -hmm. I understand the court's position. Okay. Um, I want to be able to talk. That is all. Thanks. All right. Let me take up Randall Boudreaux really quick, Lee. Miss Gonzalez. Good morning, Your Honor. What are we doing? What are we doing here on Mr. Boudreaux? So we sent over the affidavits. It came. It was brought to my attention that they're not so clear. Um, the affidavit of indigency. So we're getting them faxed over right now. Um, but aside from that, I believe we just need a trial date. Judge, the affidavit of indigency is filled out wrong. Ellie showed it to me. It's none of the defense information. It's the defense sister. Yeah, when, when we discussed this last time, the defendant had already been found indigent. And so you asked me to have his family member fill it out so that you can, so that you were, you had the information that his family was not able to pay for the investigator we were asking for. That's why it's someone else's information and not the defendant. But I, but he needs to fill out something swearing that he's indigent as well. Just yeah, and he and he already has your honor. In the beginning of the case, he was found indigent by this court, and um, that had and he's remained in custody since then. So, if you would like for him to fill it out again, we can. But my understanding is that the court already has that. If we have one, we don't need one. Okay. Suggest that. I mean, the only thing I would say, Judge, is at the point he was found indigent, he did have a court appointed attorney and had since hired the, their firm. I mean, that, but I don't know. Okay. If that changes his circumstances. I mean, he had Mr. Vasquez uh, appointed to him for quite a long time. All right. So, um, how are you able to be hired on a major case, major felony case, if he's indigent? So, we have been hired at a discounted rate. Um, and we were hired by his family member, and that is why his family member is the one who filled out the form that they're not able to pay anything on top of what they're paying us. And what they're paying us monthly is very minimal. We've been working with the family um, in order for them to be able to keep us on as retained, uh, retained counsel. All right. I, I've gotten this affidavit of indigence that is um, uns, unsigned. Let's see, unsworn declaration. And it, it's not signed. It's not in the right place. Nobody signed it. But what is filled out is um, monthly income of assets at $2,402 and expenses or ex exceed that income. And the expenses have nothing to do with expenses for an attorney. You see, I got a problem here. The, this is math. It's a science. They're getting money from somewhere that they're not telling me about. And I don't like that. I'm, it's going to have to be forthcoming. But this monthly expense exceeds their income and assets. How can that be? And you get paid. When you answer that, let me know. But and you, and like I said, Your Honor, uh, if I may, they, they are paying us a very minimal amount. Um, but there's nothing here that they I understand in, in the math. The math doesn't work. OK. Um, and yeah. no, if, if you. It doesn't bother me, I guess it's it, he can if he wants you to represent him and he they're telling me that that 
what, what, however you're getting paid is not being shown to me. I'm not sure that I really am that interested in finding out where y'all are getting uh, paid if it's a minimal amount. But the math doesn't work out. There's something weird about this that is not complete. Uh, but I'd rather them retain a lawyer than the court have to appoint somebody and cause the taxpayers to pay for it. So, so anything else about that? We're going to. Yeah, we're going to set it for, uh, y'all want a trial on this. We will set it for trial and we'll put it in the April docket. We call 18-28947, the state of Texas versus Deborah Jean Harris. What are we going to do today? Your Honor, we were negotiating, me and Mr. Boyd were uh, uh, negotiating a possible resolution in this case. We have not come up with a resolution yet. We've been negotiating a little bit. So, um, uh, I think we probably need a little more time to figure out the, the, the sentence in this case. Well, it's filed as of September, September, October, November, December. It's five going on five months old. I can certainly resolve it. These motions to revoke probation. Oh, I'm going to I'm fast tracking all I can on those because there's no reason for those to languish in jail. Really, I have one case here. Fifteen days, two, three, zero. Five, three. You're Mr. Garcia? Yes, sir. What are we going to do, John? Your, uh, your attorney is Mr. West there. There's a motion to revoke probation. Good Lord. That was a hundred yes, years. <laughs> that was, it was almost, it's filed two, two years, two and a half years ago, looks like, huh? Wow. Has he been an absconder? Yes. Okay. No. One says yes, one says no. Well, I'll figure it out. Okay. Who's the probation officer on this one? It's Miss Martinez, Judge, and she's uh, she's at a health. Who's here for, for her child? Judge, I'm sitting in for her. This Miss Broussard. Yes, I see. There she is. Okay. Has he been a, an absconder? This no, sir. It doesn't look like it, Judge. It says that. Um, he must have had a new offense, Judge, which a new offense has been dismissed. Uh, did you get that, yeah. Mr. Hamm? No, it's, I talked with Ms. Martinez, and there wasn't an update on Friday. She got an update on it, and it's been dismissed. What is? The new what? offense that, she, that he had. Okay. Well, but okay. He is, There's a motion to revoke probation filed two and a half years ago in uh, in July of 2020, and we... He's been around, but we never dealt with it. He was taken into custody, it says, Judge, according to Ms. Martinez, um, this year. Oh, in. Yeah, but it's been. This and that's why I consider him an absconder, Judge, because it's been pending since May of 20, and he just got arrested this month. But, but he's been out and. and not reporting. He hasn't reported has, since Bruce Hart, has, has he been reporting? He's been on probation since July of 2020, right? I see he was reporting judge to Cameron County. And courtesy supervision? Yes, sir. Yes. And he was he's been doing that regularly. Yes, sir. And according to this, she's had no problems with that, yes, sir. But we have like issues of uh, of drug analysis, failing to comply with outpatient treatment, per, su, su, uh, community service hours, in arrears. I mean, there's seven, there's six violations other than committing the offense of injury to a child that could have handled. I wonder why we didn't. The warrant has been pending since July of 2020, Jeff. Yeah. So he had an active warrant for his arrest. He had an active warrant for his arrest for two and a half years. Let, um, let me let me check her records, Judge, just a second. I don't understand that. She she just she said that he has been reporting to um Cameron County um and has not been absconder. He's been reporting by mail to us. Well I just, that makes no sense. That doesn't make any yeah I was gonna say that. Sorry Judge. Yeah. <laughs> Didn't mean to steal your thoughts. Yeah. Okay. There. I mean, this thing's been 
for two and a half years and nothing, nobody was moving forward on it. He's also been in and out of treatment. Did you get that judge also? For two and a half years? Yeah, he, well, back in 2019, it's showing that he was in um, outpatient treatment. Okay. Yeah, patient treatment still has responsibilities of, okay, w w when was he in outpatient treatment? In 2019, Judge. It's until when? Let me see. Let's close this. Judge, can we just reset this matter to Ms. Martinez can be available? Because that's not the conversation. Yeah, that's no, not the conversation. Right. Ms. Mr. Mr. Ham says those are not squaring with what he's aware of and what his data shows. And we got an issue. I, I, and I want to know why a motion to revoke probation was just sitting there and nobody alerted me to move forward on that thing. She also said Cameron County wouldn't have him picked up there in the office. Cameron County, CSCD, the, the community supervisor. How, no, how long has he been in custody in Cameron County, I guess, is the issue. He, he was in custody here. Since when? No, he, he got arrested. He was in custody in Cameron County as of December 27th of 2022. Right, and then transferred him to our county in January. Okay, before, how long was he in Cameron County? Uh, yeah, December 27th of looking yeah. last month. So he just went into Cameron County last yes. month? Yes, yes sir. But once again, okay. I'm going to say this one more time and that's it. Why is there a motion to revoke out for two and a half years? According to her records, Cameron County would not pick him up, would not have him picked up on our warrant. On my warrant? Really? Yes, sir. This is according to her records I'm reading right now. Well, nobody told me about that. That's a court order that's being defied. I mean, isn't there something serious about or is it just natural that all judges' orders are defied? No. Well, we're going to have to deal with that. But anyway, uh, until we do, let's move on. We can let's don't bog down on this one. This is going to have to be reset for four weeks so everybody can figure this out. But I'd like to know who was, is the responsible parties in Cameron County that defied a court's order from Jefferson County because we don't do that and. It's my understanding that court orders uh, do have effect under law, or they wouldn't be called orders. Are you Donis Evans? Yes, sir. 16-24110. There is a motion to revoke probation, first amended motion to revoke probation. Boy, don't tell me he's also from Cameron County. This was only filed four years ago. Are you kidding He's been uh, he's been absconded since 2000 and okay all right that's what I needed to know I'll tell you this though John I mean truly uh, COVID COVID didn't hit until February or March of 2020 2020 <laughs> yes so he stopped a year before that so okay y'all can spend your time talking about COVID if you want, but I'm familiar with that date because that was my daughter's wedding day. And I know in February of 2020 and right after that, all heck broke loose with COVID. Yes. Sir. I, you know, I, I know where we are on COVID. Steve Bowman. Yes. Yes, sir. That's Steve Bowman. And here we're here for sentencing. You should have a PSI report. I do. All right. Two cases are called 2240741 and 40742. Steve Bowman Jr., raise your right hand. Mr. Bowman, do you solemnly swear or affirm any statement you make today will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. Yes. Lower your hand. You have earlier pleaded guilty in these two cases, which are state jail felonies punished as though they were second degree felonies. Although it's incorrect where it says that these are second degree felonies. They are not. They are state jail felonies, but they were punished as 
second degree felonies, which is a big difference. Mr. Bowman, you are Steve Bowman Jr. Yes. And in summary, paragraph one alleges in, in each indictment, and we're going to take them up together, that is 40741 and 40742, each of these similarly alleged that on or about May 29th, 2022, in 40741, and on or about June 19th, 2022, in cause number 40742, and in both cases in Jefferson County, Texas, it is alleged that you intentionally fled from a person you knew was a peace officer attempting lawfully to detain you, and you had previously been convicted of evading detention out of County Court of Law Number 2 of Jefferson County, Texas in 1991, and evading arrest or detention on January 29, 2018, out of the 252nd District Court of Jefferson County, Texas. So paragraph one there alleges a state jail felony. And paragraphs two and three in each case similarly allege that in paragraph two that you were previously convicted of burglary of a building, a second degree felony in 1988 in the 252nd District Court of Jefferson County, Texas. And after that became final, that conviction became final. Under paragraph three, it is alleged you committed the felony of attempted burglary of a building a third degree felony and were finally convicted of that in 1990 in this criminal district court of Jefferson County, Texas. Are those allegations all true and correct in paragraphs yes. one, two, and three? Yes. And are you pleading true and correct and guilty in each of these allegations? Yes. Voluntarily, knowingly, intelligently and because those allegations are true they are true all right so if found guilty beyond a reasonable doubt this all constitutes a state jail felony being punished as a second degree felony so as you know you are facing no less than two nor more than years confinement in prison and a fine up to uh, $10,000 can be assessed on each case. Do you understand? Yes. This pre-sentence report again has been prepared and without objection, I'm going to admit it. Correct, everybody? Yes, sir. Right. All right. It is admitted. Go ahead, Mr. Dusler. Go ahead, Mr. Dusler. You can go forward. Judge, he's got a he's got a long criminal history, but most of this stuff was a long time ago. Okay, time ago, 20, 30 years ago. And he really hasn't been in any serious trouble in quite a while. Uh, these these offenses are not your typical evading with a motor vehicle that would be a felony uh, running from the police or, or walking away instead of stopping when they told him to. And but for his previous history, would be looking at a misdemeanor here. I just I just think that there's uh, you know he, he's indicated that he, both times in both of these cases he ran from the law. He doesn't really know why. He was just scared, but he knew they were doing their jobs. He knew, he knew he realizes he wasn't doing anything. They weren't doing anything to him, and uh, he, he should not have, have run. But the fact is, there's nothing particularly heinous about any of this. Uh, you know, it's a felony. We can't really do anything about that because of the priors. But he's asking the court to grant him probation. He's, he's been in jail now for a while. And, uh, you know, these are just not the, the sort of offenses, uh, despite his history, that I think warrant uh, any kind of I don't think penitentiary time at all, but certainly no serious penitentiary time. And we're asking you the granting probation. Okay, go ahead, State. I disagree. Uh, I will note for the court that the his adult misdemeanor 
history shows 12 different convictions where he got jail time. One of those is actually from May of last year where he was uh, accused of evading arrest and that probably should have had the same treatment as these because of his priors. That was actually a, a felony offense. He was lucky to get 30 days jail time. In his felony criminal history, he has 11 separate right. convictions. Of note in that regard is the last state jail felony where he was in front of this court was in 2007 and received 12 years. The last evading arrest detention with previous convictions, very similar to this offense, he received one year state jail. My point in highlighting those things is this man is 51 years old and still doesn't get it. You can make whatever argument you want to about what these offenses are. The man doesn't understand that when the police say, stop, we want to visit with you, that he gets to make up his own mind and go the other direction. That's not, that's not appropriate. That's why things, whenever it's something that is a repeat offense, gets elevated to a felony offense. Because of his prior criminal history, which extends all the way back to 1984, he has stayed consistent with criminal history as the PSI notes throughout his time frame. The only time he has a break whenever he is not showing some criminal arrest is when he's been in custody. He stayed consistent from 1984 to now, almost 40 years. I offered him 15 years before uh, they, they didn't like that, Judge, so they decided to plead unagreed. And I understand that. I know nobody really wants to go to go to prison for that period of time. But what else do we do? I think that that's uh, I made that offer because I felt like it was appropriate. I'll stand by that and asking you to assess that. Point. All right. Uh, anything you would like to say, Mr. Bowman? Charlene. What I like to say. No, I don't have anything to say. Okay. Uh, I've looked at the pre-sentence report, and according to the pre-sentence report, not counting your juvenile history, which goes back to 1984, but as an adult, you have uh, 12 misdemeanor convictions, in including uh, evading arrests. <clears throat> you have 12 felony convictions including evading arrests. You have yes. 42, yes. 42 Class C misdemeanors of public uh, et cetera. So that totals 66 convictions, 66 convictions, and now you're kind of doing the same thing you've done in the past. That's right away. And when you had an opportunity to explain yourself, your statement was, both times I ran from the law, I don't even know why. They didn't do anything to me. But I decided to run even though I okay. Well, I mean, 66 convictions is more than enough time for you to just stop. Yes, sir. Oh, he is here? All right. Yes, sir. Stand by. Hold on. I'm going to mute this uh, other. All right. Can you hear me okay, Don? Yes. And Mr. Bowman? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, I, but on the other side of the coin, I mean, you're just running from the police and uh, you... Uh, didn't hurt anybody apparently, but still they could be chasing after you and then they could hit somebody trying to cross the street or uh, just chasing after you because they had good reason to stop you. And I just wish you would follow the rules that we all have to follow. And that is when the police are attempting to stop you, you should stop as soon as possible safely and then cooperate with the police. And you wouldn't have uh, had a problem, but 
you have to know with your criminal history, you're you're looking, sir, at almost any at any period of time, you're looking at 25 years to life for any kind of felony. So you don't have room for to make mistakes, sir. Anyway, anything else to add? No, sir. I'm going to find Mr. Bowman in each of these cases. You have pleaded guilty to paragraph one, which constitutes a state jail felony, and paragraphs two and three prior convictions, which amount to a state jail felony punished as a second degree felony. You have pleaded guilty and true to paragraphs one, two, and three, respectively, in each case voluntarily, knowingly, intelligently. There is sufficient evidence supporting your guilty plea uh, and pleas of true to support your pleas to find you guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. I now find you guilty beyond a reasonable doubt in each of these cases. And you were hereby sentenced to, to confinement in the institutional division of the Texas Department of Criminal Justice to serve a term of 12 years. And you will be given credit for all time you have served. This is not 25 years, it's less than half, but you have to stop committing crimes. There is no room for error. You're looking at 25 to life from now on for felonies, sir. Please don't spend the rest of your life in prison. That is all. In each well, case, years. run concurrently. Thank you. These will Twelve years to run concurrently. Yeah. The judge sentenced you to twelve years in prison. You what need you to say? go back with the bailiff. What do you say, Don Newton? <laughs> what do you say, twelve years? Yes, sir. Um, with sixty, sixty. How many convictions? That's sixty-four convictions. In twelve years. No room for error. You have no room for error. Okay, we call from Marvin Holmes, 21-37984 and 22-39923. What are we going to do today on these? Uh, Your Honor, I have filed a motion for competency evaluation at 46B003 based on... <laughs> No. All right. To a degree of rational understanding. All right. Yeah. All right. I don't even think there's... Uh, and a real issue on this. I'm going to grant uh, this motion in abundance of caution. Are you Marvin Holmes? Yes, sir. I've been through plenty. I've been through plenty of them already. If you oh. check the record, I've already been through plenty of them. There ain't nothing wrong with me. I just filed pro se in the federal court by myself as an attorney by myself. So ain't nothing wrong with me. Okay. Uh, what's wrong with me is that this in my mouth. Pictures on what, what's in my mouth is a teeth filling that the FBI want to look at. It's a teeth filling, what they trying to hide me on. And I'm writing the FBI right now on that from Washington, D.C. about this. It's, it's a chip. I done ran my mouth already. It's an x-ray. and had an x-ray gun. I want her off my case. I want her off my case. She was on there from the beginning. I got the, I already got my records of of this chip, and she didn't look on. She got my basically. She got my Facebook. Uh, basically, she didn't already got my uh my records of my uh of my Gmail account. Well, my photo is basically on now. Basically, I got a no blue or orange chip in my mouth being tortured with this chip, and I got it in my mouth where it's sealed right now. Okay. I got black marker. All right. So, okay, uh, Mr. Holmes. Uh, okay. Thanks. I yep. want her off my case. That's what I want. Thank you. I want her off my case. Oh, yeah, we gotta go. You will use it. Hurry, hurry. No, 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 no. No, no, we're going right now. Yeah, I'm, I'm cool. 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 i am cool 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 i am Mr. Rad Wendell. Wendell. Yes, sir, Judge, I'm here. Okay, uh, you're Mr. Uh, Robert Henson. Raise your hand. No, sir, I will not. Oh, that's Robert Henson. God bless him. 
All right, he's not going to raise his hand. All no, right. uh, and the reason is, yeah. is because I have a lawsuit against you and Mr. Rapper. I don't even know why y'all trying to see me. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, what do you well. ask for there, Miss? Uh, uh, Mr. Radford and Mr. Radford asked to be recused on the night. Judge, I've filed a motion to withdraw. Mr. Henson has indicated he has filed a lawsuit against me. Well, that put, course, all they that, had to do is just file lawsuits forever, and then that would uh, that's not the way the law works, of course. You just can't just file frivolous lawsuits and get away with the rules. The rules say that the rules have to be followed. What are you asking? You're, for? you're a defendant in it as well, sir. Wow. Did you interrupt me rudely, sir? Yes, I did. Well, then shame it on wasn't you. Rudely. It wasn't rudely. I'm speaking up for myself. You can now be excused. You can now be Thank you. Thank you very much. That all kindergartners must follow in school. Be polite yeah. to each other. All right. What do you say, Wendell? Judge, I'm asking to be uh, withdrawn. I cannot communicate with this man. He has put me in a conflict of interest by suing me. I cannot communicate with him unless it's on the record for fear that he may use something against me in this lawsuit. But of course that would apply in every case, every case that could, I mean, he could do this for till time never ends. Judge, but, I cannot effectively represent this man when he's put me in this position. Well, wouldn't, is there any reason to suggest that he wouldn't do the same thing with everybody else? I don't know. That's that maybe another lawyer can get along better with him, but I cannot uh, effectively represent. Well, what I'm thinking about doing because he's so uh, he's so animated and uh, violent in the way he reacts is get Ed Grappon, Dr. Grappon, to evaluate him for competency. Uh, but uh, I haven't found him incompetent in my dealings with him, but I. I I mean, I'm, the court has absolute every authority and right to do that, but I just, I cannot visit with him. I cannot talk to him, communicate well, with him. I know, but can you articulate any reason that you have caused him? I know I can't. I don't know what he's on my case for, but have you are, can you articulate any reason that would cause him to show animosity like he shows? He had a case set for trial. He had three cases set for trial in October. One of them was an old uh, aggravated assault that was set number one. And then he was recently indicted on a burglary and a possession of a firearm by a felon. The aggravated assault was called number one. Mr. Laird dismissed that case because he could not find the complaining witness. Okay, but what, no, answer the question. Can you call, can you articulate any reason why he's so, uh, uh, animated and uh, physically upset with you as well as the court. I can't. After, after that case, the, the second case got reset to the January trial docket. I went to talk to him to prepare him for the January trial docket, at which time he informed me he had filed a lawsuit against me and refused to speak to me. So I have no idea. No. He wouldn't tell me. He well, just asked me if I had been served yet. This is, this is the second lawyer he's done that to. I mean, he, of course, stalled until the end of time by threatening lawsuits. But that doesn't. I, I don't. What are you supposed to do? He's going to do. He's shown two in a row now that that's what he's learned to do. And he I'm, gets paid by having a temper tantrum like a kindergartner. And there is the rules are built in not to allow that sort of thing. It's we've got to run the show as far as following the rules. He doesn't get to choose uh, the people. Has he even said anything about any wants to hire? I don't. I don't know. He would. He would not talk to me other than to say he had filed a lawsuit and wanted to know if I had been served. What I'm representing to the court is that I cannot effectively represent this man if he's going to act like that towards me, and I'm asking to withdraw. And well, I, I want to make a record of that. He does that to everybody. You're a smart guy. 
the law has got to be built up to deal with those kinds of situations. What does the law say on that? If every time somebody gets appointed, he has a lawsuit on them. I mean, where does that end? It, this seems to be the first lawsuit that I've heard that he filed against the lawyer. No, he, he was antagonistic about the previous lawyer, who was Mr. Freeman. I don't think he sued him, though. Well, I don't think he had a time to. I think it was uh, aggravated. But, but apparently, let's say he does that in every case. Where's the law built in on dealing with that? Judge, I, I don't know. My responsibility is to me and my law license. And what I'm telling you is I cannot effectively represent him if well, he's going to sue me. But you also represent, you know, you have to represent, you have to look at whatever best interest for the defendant. Yes, sir. And my best interest for the defendant I'm representing to the court is that you appoint him another attorney that perhaps can effectively communicate with him better than I can. And you weren't doing your best to effectively communicate with him? I thought I was. I thought you were. But apparently I wasn't. Well, I mean, is he the litmus test to what's reasonable? No, sir. I have difficult clients that I've able to communicate with, but when they tell me they've filed a lawsuit against me, right. that puts me in a conflict of interest. Well, what we'll do is uh, I'm going to send Dr. Groupon uh, under the court's own motion uh, to analyze the man, and then I will find some relief for you on this. Thank you, Judge. That is all.